Hey everyone, welcome to episode 10 of My Favorite Norn Scripts. To celebrate this milestone, I'm going to be covering the most requested script by far, Cheat Codes 2 by Dan Dirks. Cheat Codes is described as a sample playground. The simplest way I can explain the script is that it's made up of three banks that each behave like a mini MPC. Each bank can source audio from one of the three live buffers or from audio files saved to Norns. Once you've loaded an audio file, you can chop it up across each bank's 16 pads and record the patterns you create. There are also some effects and multiple interesting pattern generators. This script is incredibly deep and complex, so I'm just going to get right into it. When you launch the script, you'll see the main menu with nine submenus. Before I get into any of the menus, I want to go over what the encoders and buttons do. Encoders 1 and 2 are used to navigate through the different parameters. Holding button 1 will bring up the macro and outgoing MIDI config menus. To enter the macro menu, press button 2 while holding button 1. Macros allow you to control multiple parameters with one knob. You can then use Norn's external MIDI or Crow to control that macro. By default, encoder 1 will navigate between the 8 different macro groups and encoders 2 and 3 will let you view macros 1 through 8 for each group. Pressing button 3 will swap focus to the macro controls. Encoder 3 will now scroll through the different parameters. The available parameters are current pad, rate, pan, bank level, filter tilt, start point, which will select from evenly distributed points along the sample length, end point, which will also select from evenly distributed points, start delta, which is instead relative, end delta, which is again relative, delay division slash multiple, which controls the speed of the clock delay, delay free time, delay rate, which sets the playback speed of the delayed signal, delay pan, macro, which allows you to activate other macros with one macro control, and the final destinations are all for the whimsical wraps with your rack module. Once you've selected a parameter, you can use encoder 2 to continue down the menu. Target sets which bank will be affected by the macro. Min and max sets the range of the macro. Curve will smooth out the outgoing data. To activate the selected macro, hold button 1 and press button 2. Now that the macro is active, you can map any external MIDI device to control it in the mapping menu or control it from the parameter menu. You can also control the active macro from this menu. If you press button 3 while holding button 1, you'll bring up the random macro display. In this screen, you can output a random value with button 3. To enter the outgoing MIDI config menu, press button 3 while holding button 1. This menu allows you to configure the MIDI messages the pads in each bank will output. By default, you'll be in bank A, but you can move between A, B, and C with encoder 1. Once you're in the desired bank, you can press button 3 to advance to the next set of controls. There is one control available from the header menu that I want to touch on before getting into the MIDI assignment controls. Holding button 1 will bring up the scale output. This will set the MIDI note values to the appropriate numbers for the desired scale. You can scroll through all the different scales with encoder 3. Pressing button 3 in this menu will reverse the note layout so the notes will go in descending order instead of ascending. Now moving on to the main controls. The first batch determines the note and velocity for the given pad. Encoder 1 will scroll between the different pads. Encoder 2 will adjust the note. And encoder 3 will adjust the velocity. Pressing button 3 again will swap to the MIDI CC controls. This allows you to output MIDI CC messages when a pad is triggered. Once again, encoder 1 will scroll between the different pads. Encoder 2 will set the CC number. And encoder 3 will adjust the value. Before moving on from the MIDI config menu, there is one additional hidden menu. If you are focused on the note values, holding button 2 will bring up two options. Pressing button 3 will set all of the notes to 81, which is A5. Pressing button 1 will set all velocities to 127 or max. If you're focused over the MIDI CC controls and hold button 2, button 3 will set all the MIDI CCs to their default inactive state and button 1 will set all the CC out velocities to 127. Pressing button 2 will return you to the main menu. Here, holding button 2 will bring up the transport controls. Encoder 1 will navigate between transport, tap, and click. On the transport page, encoder 2 will adjust the BPM by 1, and encoder 3 will adjust the BPM by 0.1. Button 3 will start or stop playback. On the tap page, encoders 2 and 3 will once again adjust the BPM, but here button 3 can be used to tap in the desired tempo. Finally, the click page allows you to toggle on or off a metronome click with button 3. Now that those controls are out of the way, we can move on to the submenus. 
The first submenu is the loops menu. This is where you assign either a live recording or pre-recorded clip to the pads. You can control banks A, B, and C from this menu. Since the controls for all three are identical, I'm only going to be explaining bank A. When you first enter the menu, you'll be seeing the global view. In this view, Encoder 1 will navigate between banks A, B, and C, the live buffer, and the loops view. Encoder 2 will set the source for all pads in the current bank, either live buffer 1, 2, or 3, or clip 1, 2, or 3. If you select clip, this will allow you to load an audio file from Norns. Holding button 1 will bring up a bunch of controls that I'll get into shortly, but pressing button 3 while continuing to hold button 1 will bring up the audio files menu. You can select an audio file from here and it will be loaded into clip 1. Encoder 3 will transpose all the pads in the current bank by semitones with a range of 24 up or down or 2 octaves. Holding button 1 will allow you to bring up some additional controls. You can use encoder 1 to select the alternate controls. Now encoder 2 will double or have the playback speed of all pads in the bank. Negative values will change the playback direction to reverse. Encoder 3 will adjust the speed ramp. At higher values the speed changes will glide and at lower values the changes will be instantaneous. Holding button 2 will bring up the loop toggle. Pressing button 3 while continuing to hold button 2 will toggle looping for all pads in the bank. Pressing button 3 will switch to the local view. This view allows adjustments to be made on a per pad basis. Encoder 1 will move the playback window. This allows you to change the start point of the pad while retaining the same length. Encoder 2 will adjust the start point and Encoder 3 will adjust the end point. Holding button 1 will enter zoom mode. Pressing button 2 while holding button 1 will set the global BPM to match the length of the current loop. Pressing button 3 while holding button 1 will randomly set the start and end points of the current pad. While holding button 1, turning encoder 1 will scroll through the different pads in the bank. While continuing to hold button 1, you can turn encoders 2 and 3 to fine tune the start and end points. Back on the main local screen, holding button 2 will bring up the same controls from the global window, except these can be adjusted on a per pad basis. You can set the buffer or clip for each pad and transpose it in semitones. Using encoder 1, you can navigate down to the second set of controls, and from here change the playback rate and rate slew. While continuing to hold button 2, pressing button 3 will activate looping for the current pad. So those are all the bank controls, now I'm going to move on to the live controls. These will affect the behavior of the live buffer. You can access these by navigating to the L with encoder 1. By default, you'll see the buffer and any audio you've recorded into it. There's a playback slash record head indicator and the two parameters at the bottom are for feedback and random probability. Encoder 2 will adjust the feedback and encoder 3 will adjust the random probability. Feedback is similar to the feedback on Otis. At higher values, you'll be able to do sound on sound looping and at lower values, the previously recorded material will lower in volume each pass until it's inaudible. Random probability sets the likelihood that recording will be toggled on. Holding button 1 brings up some more controls. You can select the alternate controls with encoder 1. Now encoder 2 will set the record mode, either loop or one shot. Loop will continue recording until it's toggled off. One shot will record once for the full duration and then stop recording. Total control is the duration of the live buffer in seconds. By default it's set to 8 seconds but it can be increased to 16 or 32 seconds. If you've recorded audio and then changed the duration, the previously recorded audio will have its playback speed changed. For example, if I record something into an 8 second buffer and then switch it to a 16 second buffer, the original recording will now play back at half speed. To toggle on recording, hold button 2 and then press button 3. Pressing button 3 will bring up some more controls for the live buffer. From here you can fine tune the start and end points with encoders 2 and 3. Holding button 1 and then pressing button 2 will erase the buffer. The final element of the loop submenu is the loops view. You can find this by navigating all the way to the right to the hashtag symbol. This shows what all the banks are doing as well as the current playback position of the live buffer. Pressing button 3 will move you from the header to the body. Once you're in the body of the menu, you can use encoder 1 to navigate between the different banks and live buffer. Holding button 1 and turning encoder 1 will scroll through the different pads of the current bank. Encoder 2 is used to adjust the start time of the current pad, and encoder 3 will adjust the end time. Holding button 1 while adjusting the start and end times will allow you finer resolution. Holding button 2 and turning encoder 1 will move the current pad's playback window while retaining the overall length. 
Holding button 2 and pressing button 3 will evenly distribute the audio across all 16 pads. Holding button 2 and pressing button 1 will shorten the loop lengths of all the pads to 16th note divisions of the current BPM. The next submenu is Levels. This menu allows you to set individual pad levels, overall bank levels, and apply volume envelopes. Encoder 1 controls bank A, encoder 2 controls bank B, and encoder 3 controls bank C. By default, the adjustments are made on a per pad basis, but holding button 1 will instead apply the changes to all of the pads in the desired bank. Just like with the loop submenu, these controls are all identical between banks, so I'm just going to be demoing bank A. The first set of controls adjust the volume of the specified pad. You can dial in some volume variation to give the different pads a more dynamic feel. Holding button 1 will swap to the bank volume control. The overall output is determined by multiplying the pad volume by the bank volume. The bank volume control is helpful for fading in an entire bank while retaining the individual pad volume variations. Pressing button 3 will move on to the envelope controls. You can use encoder 1 to select one of the three available shapes. The shapes are falling, rising, or rise fall. Pressing button 3 again will allow you to toggle on cycle with encoder 1. If cycle is active, the envelope will re-trigger once it reaches the end. Finally, pressing button 3 again will bring up the envelope time control. This sets the length of the envelope in seconds. For the rise fall shape, the time will reflect the overall length of the envelope instead of a single stage. Just like for the bank volume, holding button 1 while adjusting any of the envelope controls will apply them to all pads in the bank. The next submenu is the pans menu. The pan controls behave similarly to the volume controls. Once again, encoder 1 is used for bank A, encoder 2 is used for bank B, and encoder 3 is used for bank C. Also like the volume menu, holding button 1 will instead apply the changes to the entire bank instead of an individual pad. The cool thing about this is that applying a bank-wide pan will be displayed on each individual pad when you release button 1. This makes it easy to introduce lots of pan variation. After pans, we have the filter controls. Once again, encoder 1 will control bank A, encoder 2 will control bank B, and encoder 3 will control bank C. Unlike the previous two submenus, by default the filter controls will be bank-wide instead of pad by pad. You can toggle between the two options by long pressing button 1. The first control is the filter cutoff. In the middle, there is no filtering being done. Moving to the left will activate the low pass filter, and moving to the right will activate the high pass filter. You can move between the different controls with button 3. The first one sets the slew time for cutoff changes in seconds. The second one allows you to adjust the filter resonance. Higher values are more resonant. Finally, we have the encoder behavior. Continuous will slew to new values, whereas jumpy will snap to them. Now we have the delays menu. The last two menus are pretty self-explanatory, but the delays menu is a bit tricky. I'm going to go through the pages in order. In this menu, encoder 1 will swap between left and right. You have full control over the rate, feedback, filter controls, and time for each side, as well as the send amount for each pad. Encoder 2 will move between the different pages. The first page is for the delay controls. The second page is for the filter controls. And the third page handles the routing. Pressing button 3 will enter the selected menu's controls. In any of these menus, you can hold button 1 and press button 3 to link the left and right. The first parameter is the clocked or free toggle. If clocked is selected, the delays will be X number of beats of the current BPM. If free is selected, the delays will be measured in seconds, and the time can range from 0 to 30 seconds. To move on to the next parameter, use encoder 2. This controls the clocked or free time. Fade will fade in the delayed signal. Make sure the fade time is less than your delay time, otherwise the signal will be silent. Rate determines the playback rate of the delayed signal. It can range from quarter speed to 24 times speed. Holding button 1 allows fine tuning. For some reason from this menu I can't lower the rate below 1 without using the fine tune button, but from the grid you can access those speeds more easily. More on that later. When changing the rate, audio that has already been played will adjust according to the rate changes before settling at the current rate. This is similar to how Otis handles speed changes. If you want to keep the pitch shifted delay intact, set the feedback to 100% and then change the rate. The final control here is the feedback percentage. This behaves the same way as the recording feedback. At 100%, the delayed signal will loop indefinitely, and at 0%, it will repeat once. Holding button 1 while on the feedback amount will activate quick jump. If your feedback percentage is at 0, activating quick jump will set it to 100%, and stay there until you let go of button 1. If your starting percentage is anything greater than zero, 
then pressing button 1 will change the percentage to 0 for as long as you hold the button. The next set of controls are for the filter. These are pretty self-explanatory. The first parameter is for the filter cutoff. The second one is for the Q value or resonance. Lower Q values increase the peak of the filter with a value of 0 self-oscillating. The next three controls are level controls for the different linked filters. By default, the low pass filter is active and the high pass and band pass filters are inactive. You can adjust the mix of these individually. The final control here is for the dry amount. This allows you to bypass all three filters or blend in a dry signal with the filtered signal. The final set of controls are the mix controls. To apply changes to the bank instead of to the individual pads, hold button 1 while making changes to any of these parameters. From here you can set the amount of signal being sent to the delay, set the through behavior, and control the main output level. In controls the level of the audio being sent to the delay. Higher values will increase the volume of the delayed signal. Through controls how the audio coming from a bank or pad is sent to the delay. If through is false then the output to the delay is the input value multiplied by the pad level. If through is true then the output is only determined by the input level. By setting through to true you can hear the delayed signal even if the group or pad level is all the way down. Finally we have the main output level. This is basically a dry wet control for the delayed signal. The next menu is the timing menu. This is where you can edit and generate patterns. Encoder 1 is used to navigate between patterns 1, 2, and 3, which correspond to banks A, B, and C, and also access some ARC controls. I don't have an ARC controller, so I won't be covering those. The pattern pages are all identical, so I'm just going to go over pattern 1. The first option is record mode. This can either be loose or a set number of bars. To adjust the number of bars, hold button 1 and use encoder 3. The length can range from a quarter bar to 16 bars. Shuffle pattern will jumble up a recorded pattern and can be activated with button 3 if a pattern has been recorded. Toggling on P1 sets BPM will sync the global BPM with the length of a loose recorded pattern. Random pattern will generate a random pattern when button 3 is pressed. You can adjust the rate behavior when generating a pattern with encoder 3. By default, the random pattern will keep the original rates. The different options are full range, which sets the rates anywhere from 1 8 speed to quadruple speed, high rates, which set the rate to either double or quadruple speed, mid rates, which will range from half speed to double speed, and low rates, which will range from 1 8 speed to half speed. Any of these options, with the exception of keep rates, can play back any of the pads forward or reverse. There are some more parameters related to the random pattern generation available in the parameters menu, which I'll touch on later. The last two options allow you to adjust the start and end steps for the current pattern. Once you've recorded or generated a pattern, there will also be a new display where the record mode used to be, which will tell you the current pattern step. Holding button 1 and pressing button 3 will erase the current pattern. The Euclid menu gives you access to a Euclidean sequencer that is perfect for instantaneous pattern generation. The top row is for bank A, the middle row is for bank B, and the bottom row is for bank C. You can swap between the different lanes with encoder 1. K represents the number of pulses per pattern, and N represents the number of steps. The pulses will be distributed along the pattern evenly or as close to evenly as possible. Holding button 1 will bring up some additional controls. You can swap between the banks with encoder 1 and adjust the parameters with encoders 2 and 3. The mode can be set to single or span. If single is selected, each note of the pattern will trigger the same pad, which is whichever one you press on the grid. If span is selected, then by default each step will correspond to a pad. For example, if you have a note triggering at steps 1, 3, and 5, then pads 1, 3, and 5 will play. Rate will set the note divisions ranging from 16th notes to 1 bar. Button 3 is used to swap focus between the left and right control columns. R will rotate the pattern. This can be used to change up where the notes are triggering within a pattern as well as change which pads are playing if span mode is active. The plus and minus sign parameter will offset the playing pad. This can be either a positive or negative value. If a negative value is selected, then the playing pad will be determined by moving in reverse from the current pad. Holding button 1 brings up some additional controls here too. Encoder 2 will set the auto rotate amount. Encoder 3 will set the auto offset amount. If span mode is on, setting the auto rotate amount to 1 will advance the pad forward by 1 each time an event is encountered. Euclid is a great way to quickly generate patterns and get interesting results with a fairly simple interface. ARP is another great way to generate interesting patterns on the fly. Encoder 1 will change the focus between banks A, B, and C. Encoder 2 will navigate between the different ARP parameters, and Encoder 3 will adjust them. Pressing button 1 will shift from bank-wide adjustments to pad-specific ones. 
The parameters available here are rate ranging from one bar to 30 second notes with some triplet divisions thrown in, ARP playback modes which are forward, backward, pendulum which plays forward and then backwards, and random. S and E will adjust the start and end points of the sequence and retrig will toggle retrigger on or off. If retrigger is on, then additional grid entries will retrigger the ARP. Like I mentioned before, pressing button 1 will switch the focus to individual pads. This allows each pad to have unique rates and playback modes. Pressing button 3 will activate the sequencer. Now you can press some pads on the grid. Pressing button 3 again will lock the sequencer. Pressing button 3 for a third time will pause the sequencer. And pressing it again will play again. Holding button 3 and then pressing and holding button 2 will bring up the clear option. You can then let go of button 3 and press it again to clear the sequence. The final sub menu is the random value generators menu. This is where things can get really crazy. Encoder 1 will swap between banks A, B, and C. Encoder 2 will select one of the seven generators per bank. Button 3 will focus into the generator's parameters. Once in this menu, Encoder 2 will select a parameter and Encoder 3 will adjust it. The available parameters are Pan, Rate, Rate Slew, Delay Send, Loop, Semitone Offset, and Filter Tilt. Mode will swap between destructive and non-destructive. Destructive will overwrite the values that are in place, whereas non-destructive will temporarily adjust them until the pad is re-triggered. The clock allows you to set the rate at which the modulation occurs. Finally, you can set the upper and lower bounds for each parameter. The modulation won't exceed the limits. I'm just going to do a quick demo of this. I'm going to be using the same ARP from before. And I'm targeting the pan parameter of bank A here. I have this set on non-destructive. I'm going to set the clock to 1 8th. And I have the min and max set to 100. To activate this, hold button 1 and press button 3. I also want to introduce some semitone offset. I'm going to set the clock to quarter notes. And I have it set to octave and fifth. I'm going to activate this now. As you can imagine, this will get pretty crazy pretty quick. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that there's a tongue going on in the parameters menu. Before we even get into the actual menus, there's a grid slash arc page with some controls. Grid LED style lets you choose between very bright, four step, and grayscale. Grid size lets you swap between 128 and 64 for users of the 64 grid. Vert rotation allows you to swap the orientation of the grid depending on whether you want the USB port on the top or bottom. MIDI grid enables the use of the MIDI grid library, which turns a launch pad or Ableton push into a grid controller. Arc size toggles between the two and four dial arc controller. There's also a crow submenu here, but I'm not going to be covering that. The first submenu is the collections menu. From here, you can save your cheat code session and all your audio files. Load collection will recall a saved collection. Collect live buffers will save the audio in your live buffers. Save new collection will save the current state of cheat codes and you can name it using the encoders. Overwrite loaded collection will save over whatever collection you have loaded at the moment. Delete collection will delete the current collection. Save default collection will set the current session as the default for when cheat codes is launched. The normal preset system is incompatible with cheat codes so you'll need to use this method for saving and loading sessions. The next submenu is the loops and buffers menu. There are a lot of parameters here that are available from the loops menu. Clip 1, 2, and 3 sample allow you to load an audio file from Norns' audio folders. Save live buffers 1, 2, and 3 will save the current live buffer to cheat code's audio folder. Left and right incoming audio level allows you to adjust the input levels of the left and right inputs. The live record behavior options are the same as the loops menu and let you switch between loop and one shot. One shot sync sets the behavior for one shot recording. Next beat and next bar will wait for the next beat and bar respectively to begin recording. Free will record immediately, and Threshold will only record once the specified threshold is crossed. Threshold recording is my personal favorite and I find it super useful. If you choose Threshold, you'll see an additional parameter pop up underneath. This lets you set the threshold for recording. One Shot Offsets Loop will set the end of the buffer to wherever you stop recording when using One Shot Mode. Latency Offset allows for some delay compensation. 
Record loop encoder resolution allows you to set the buffer window start and endpoint adjustments to either millisecond increments or beat divisions. Live 1, 2, and 3 record feedback is the same control that is available from the loops menu. Live buffer max is also the same control from the loops menu. The purge resets loop controls for loop 1, 2, and 3 allow you to double tap the live audio erase key combo to clear the entire segment, not just the audio within the loop points. Random record probabilities for 1, 2, and 3 are also found in the main loops menu. Encoder resolution for banks A, B, and C is the same as the record loop resolution, with the start and end time changes being either millisecond divisions or beat divisions. Fade time for A, B, and C lets you control how long of a fade in and out you'd like on each pad. By default, all three have a 10 millisecond fade, which is also the maximum. The lower the fade, the more clicks you'll hear when the pads play and stop. Finally, we have the global settings. The global pitch offset is the same parameter that is available from the loops menu. Preview clip changes will enable or disable previewing audio files when loading them into one of the clip slots. Visual metronome will turn on or off a small metronome display in the loops menu. The next submenu is the timing, patterns, and ARPS menu. The first three controls toggle on live quantization for pads A, B, and C. This will quantize live button presses. Patterns launch at allows you to lock pattern launch to either next bar or beat. Grid pattern style allows you to swap between classic and rad sauce. If rad sauce is enabled, then the zilchmo controls from row 4 can be recorded into a pattern. I'll be explaining what zilchmo controls are in the grid portion of this video. Sync BPM to free pattern is the same control from the timing menu. I had said during the timing section of the video that there were some more parameters for random pattern generation, and these are them. The pattern style can be either random, horizontal, handshake, vertical, vertical snake, top in, bottom in, zigzag, or wrap. Underneath you can also set the note lengths to specific divisions instead of them being random. After that are some controls for the ARP. We have hold style for 1, 2, and 3. This can be switched between last pressed and additive. If additive is selected, additional key presses can be added to the playing pattern instead of resetting it. The ARP rate controls are the same controls from the ARPS menu. Finally we have the ARP reset button which can be activated with button 3. This is the same ARP reset from the ARP menu. The last set of controls in this menu are for the metronome. We can toggle metronome audio on or off here, as well as set the pitch for the different beats. The next submenu is the pattern management menu. This menu allows you to save up to 8 different patterns per bank and then load them. Iterative load will cycle through your saved patterns with button 3. You can also delete any of your saved patterns from here. The mappable control submenu gives you access to a lot of the controls we've seen before. I think the purpose of this menu is to put all of these parameters in one convenient place for MIDI mapping. If you go to the map menu and then enter this submenu, it makes MIDI mapping all of these different parameters really easy. Bank LFOs give you three LFOs per bank. One is for pan, one is for level, and one is for filter tilt. For filter tilt, a positive value will be a high pass filter and a negative value will be a low pass one. When you toggle one of the LFOs on, you'll see a bunch of controls pop up. If you've watched my other Norns videos, a lot of these controls will be familiar. Depth affects the intensity of the LFO. LFO min and max will set the range of the LFO. LFO position will set the starting point for the LFO either from minimum, from maximum, or from center. LFO mode sets whether the rate is synced to bars or free. Rate will set the speed either in bar divisions if synced or in hertz if free. LFO shape will set the shape of the LFO either sine, square, or random. Finally, we have Reset LFO. Pressing button 3 will reset the LFO either to the floor or ceiling depending on what you have it set to below. Euclid has all of the same controls that are accessible from the main Euclid menu. The only additional parameter here is Mute, which will mute the selected bank. The last submenu in this group is the Delays page. You can save the configuration of your delays here as well as load them. Almost all of these parameters are available from the main Delays page, but there is one additional option here. Rate bump sets the behavior of the bump key on the grid. It can be set to either fifth or detune. The next set of submenus are all for interfacing with external gear. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through these in depth since not everyone will be using this feature. OSC setup is used for setting up touch OSC. MIDI note slash OPZ setup is for using the Teenage Engineering OPZ as a controller. MIDI encoder setup is for mapping a MIDI device with knobs, such as the MIDI Fighter Twister. Pad to note setup is the same menu that you can access from the main screen, but there are a few additional controls, like being able to set the octave range the notes will output to. Finally, this last menu is for setting up the whimsical wraps with Eurorack module. 
The last group in the parameters page is the meta section. Macros give you control over the eight macros from the main screen. Here you can use Encoder 3 to control them individually. You can also map all of these to an external MIDI controller using the map menu. Macro LFOs are per macro LFOs. These have the same layout as the bank LFOs and will affect their respective macros. Transport settings are used for interfacing with external MIDI devices. Here you can set the ARP behavior, send MIDI transport, receive MIDI transport, and send a MIDI clock. You can also use these options to control your DAW's playback with cheat codes. Cheat codes might have the most extensive set of grid controls out of any Norn script and is the only script I'm aware of that uses the grid in a vertical layout. I'm going to do my best to explain the grid, but I strongly recommend reading the docs on the cheat codes lines page. Today I'm going to be calling the columns 1 through 8 and the rows A through P. There are three pages of controls and you can flip between them using 8P. The first page is the performance page. There are three identical sets of controls here, one per bank. Bank A takes up the first five rows. The 16 pads in columns 1 through 4 and rows A, B, C, and D are used for playing whatever audio you've loaded or recorded. Buttons 5, 6, and 7A are used to swap between either buffers 1, 2, or 3 or clips 1, 2, or 3. Button 8A is the pad focus lock. You can activate this by holding Alt. There are actually two Alt buttons. There's the lowercase Alt, which is 5E for Bank A. I'll refer to that one as the Bank Alt, and the All Caps Alt, which I'll call the Global Alt. The Global Alt can be found at 1P. If pad focus is on, pressing a button won't play back the audio. This is useful for editing a slice when a pattern is playing. Button 5B will set the source for the current bank to a live buffer, and button 6B will set it to a clip. Button 7B is another button that requires Alt to work. This will create a random pattern. For most button combos that require Alt, either can be used, but for some you'll need to use a specific one. Button 8B is the pattern button. If the key is at its lowest brightness setting, it means there is no pattern. Pressing it will arm pattern recording, and recording will start when you press one of the pads. To stop recording and activate playback, press it again. Pressing the button again will pause playback. Holding the bank alt and pressing it again will activate overdub mode. You can tell overdub is on because the button will be at its brightest. To reset the pattern, hold the global alt and press the pattern button. 5C is the loop toggle button. If the button is illuminated, it means looping is active. By default, the looping will only be turned on for the current pad, but holding Alt and pressing it will turn looping on for the entire bank. Six C is the ARP toggle. Pressing it again while holding down one or more pad will lock it. Depending on how you set the ARP behavior in the parameters menu, you can press additional pads once it's locked to add them to the sequence. To clear the ARP, hold the bank alt and press the ARP button. 5D will return all the pads to normal playback rate. To activate this, hold either alt and press it. The final set of controls for bank A are the zilch mode controls. These are all the illuminated pads in the shape of a right triangle. There are multiple different gestures per row and they can be used to enter rate changes, window length changes, pan changes, loop length changes, and volume changes. There are 25 different combos in total. Instead of going through all of them individually, I suggest you refer to pages 35 and 36 in the cheat codes main doc, which will be linked in the video description. Generally, row 4, which is from 5E to 8E, is used to enter loop adjustments and rate changes. Row 3, which is from 6D to 8D, is used for panning, and 7C and 8C are used for volume changes. 
Now that the bank controls are out of the way, that just leaves the bottom row, row P. Like I said before, 1P is the global alt. 2P will record arm live buffer 1, 3P will record arm live buffer 2, and 4P will record arm live buffer 3. And once again, 8P will flip between the grid pages. Pressing either alt and one of the buffer record buttons will clear that buffer. The next page is the pattern sequencer. Each bank has its own sequencer. The sequencer for bank A is once again spread over the first five rows. This sequencer is a bit tricky. Row A allows you to store up to eight patterns or ARP layouts. Row B sets the clock. Moving to the right slows the clock down. Rows C and D display the current sequencer by step. Row E displays the length of the current step. You can change the length of each step by pressing and holding the desired step and then adjusting the length in row E. So if I want step one of the sequencer to be longer, press and hold there and adjust here. There are a few additional controls in the bottom row. 2P will toggle on or off bank A's sequencer. 3P will do the same for bank B and 4P will do the same for bank C. Holding 7P will turn on loop mode. When loop mode is active, you can press two points within the sequence and that segment will be looped. Holding alt and long pressing a pattern at the top will clear that pattern. Holding alt and pressing an active step on the sequencer will clear that step. Holding alt and pressing the bank's toggle will reset the sequencer to step one. I know that sounded confusing, so I'm going to do a quick demo because it's really not as bad as it sounds. Once you have an ARP you like, you can save it to one of these slots. I'm going to make another ARP pattern now. And save that one to slot 2. This pad is silent, I'm going to save this one as well. Now I can add these patterns to the sequencer. The final grid page is the delays page. From here you get full control over the delays as well as access to banks A, B, and C's pads and row 4 of the Zilchmo controls. The controls on this page are mirrored. The left side is for the left delay and the right side is for the right. I'm just going to go over the controls for the left side which span across columns 1 through 4. Columns 1 and 2 from rows A to H are save slots. You can press any slot in here to save the current state of the delay. To recall that delay, press the button again. Holding Alt and pressing a save slot will reset it. To make it easier to hear the changes, I'm going to make a simple ARP. One N through one J will control the send level for a specific pad. One N is 0%, one M is 25%, 1L is 50%, 1K is 75%, and 1J is 100%. If you hold Alt and make an adjustment here, it will instead apply the send level to the entire bank. I'm setting the entire bank to send at 75%. 1O is the jump button. This behaves the same way as the jump in the main delay page. 3A will increase the time of the delay, 3B will decrease it, 3C will reverse the delay. 3D through 3H control the level of the delay. The increments are the same as the send. 3i is a jump button for the level and behaves the same way as the send level jump button. 4a will increase the playback rate of the delay. 4b will decrease it. 4c is the rate bump button. I mentioned this during the parameter section of the video. In that menu, you can either set it to detune or fifth. Pressing it will either detune the delayed signal or raise it by a fifth, depending on how you set it up. 4d through 4h control the feedback of the delay and follow the same layout as the send and delay level. 4i is also a jump button and behaves the same way as the other jump buttons, except it affects the feedback level. Holding Alt and pressing the feedback jump button will clear the delay buffer. This is useful for instances where you're using the delay buffer at high feedback levels. 
Those are all the delay controls. Like I said, the right side is laid out exactly the same, just flipped to the opposite side. The final group of controls here are the pads. Columns 3 through 6 and rows J through M are the 16 pads of bank A by default. 3N will set the bank to A, 4N will set it to B, and 5N will set it to C. 7N will activate the arpeggiator for the current bank, and 7O will toggle looping on and off for the selected pad. The ARP and loop buttons behave the same way they do on the performance page and will respond to the ALT button accordingly. Finally, 3O through 6O are row 4 of the Zilch Mo controls from the performance page. I'm going to do a quick demo of what you can do with this page performance wise. Like OO, Cheat Codes definitely feels like its own self-contained workstation. It's so extensive that it could be its own standalone piece of gear and I don't think anyone would be disappointed with it. I can definitely add Cheat Codes to the list of scripts that I thought I had a decent handle on, but through the process of making a video, realized I had no idea what I was doing. There's so much more going on here than I initially thought and it really is mind-blowing. I didn't even go into depth on the multiple external ways to control Cheat Codes, ranging from Touch OSC to the Max for Live device CC OSC. These are all linked in the lines page, which I'll be including in the video description. If you want to learn more about cheat codes, Dan has two on-demand video courses available, and Dueling Ants, who is an absolute cheat codes wizard, has a couple of YouTube videos about how he uses the script. These are all linked in the lines page, but I'll put direct links in the video description as well. I just want to thank everyone who's been tuning into these episodes and providing such encouraging feedback. I also want to thank the authors of all the scripts I've covered over the last 10 weeks. They were all so approachable and happy to answer any questions I had during the research process, and that means a lot. As always, thank you for watching. If you have any scripts or topics you'd like me to cover in a future video, leave a comment below, and I'll see you next week.